The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. This is awesome. Uh, comment allez-vous. We're going over to Paris. What's happening? Hey, Tom. It's Adam from Paris. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Adam. Yourself? That's good. Long time no talk. I appreciate everything you've done for me and my family over the years. So well, We appreciate uh, your growling question. problem with us. Yeah, 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 sir. I've done gold report and all the softwares and all your books and read it. Generational thank you. You are, seminars, Thank so you so much. Appreciate it. Yes, yeah, sir. Now, Tom O'Brien. What? What's going on, everyone? This is Jacob Shoup filling in for Tom O'Brien. I'm not sure if I'm on the screen right now. Um, yeah, I'm filling in for him today. I hope you guys are all having a great week. Um, we didn't have Tim on Tuesday or Thursday, called to see if he was going to be able to be on today. Didn't work out. We're going to resume that uh, on Tuesday and Thursday just because we had some people asking about it. Uh, everyone's doing well. We have the, let's take a look what we got going on here. All right, we got the SPY up trading at 560.75, about 0.43% right now. This common Friday V-shape uh, rocking right now. Uh, pretty much off the lows of the day. Yeah, the Russell futures kind of flat right now. NQ's trading up 0.66%. Man, we got a lot to talk about, at least in uh, tech, in a way. Uh, you have the Dow futures sideways right now, and then, of course, the Dow Jones itself just kind of sideways. The gold contract, still doing pretty strong, kind of off the high that we made, but still up in the 25, uh, 31 area. Obviously, you have the dollar kind of getting a little bounce back, um, which, you know, a lot of times can bring selling pressure um, in the market, uh, both equities and uh, gold as well. But commodities are looking kind of cool right now, kind of in that line with gold. Taking a look at Newmont, um, the thing just looks pretty strong right now. Again, I would say as well, if you're trying to get really into these metals, strongly recommend doing the gold report uh, by Tom O'Brien. Yeah, we're trading at 53. 18 in Newmont, got a lot of Tigers looking at that. Currently, still dynamics up about 0.33%. Tesla doing a little bit all right, up about 2.51%. Silver down 273 and then copper off about 0.19% uh, right now. Lucid not doing much. Let's take a look at Rivian on this long-term play. Trading at 1397, kind of an interesting pattern, right? You gap down heavily, you test that again. Now, we did crack below the kind of the low of that high volume trade um, for a few trading sessions, actually. But back up above it right now. Uh, we'll see if we can start moving a little bit. Again, you know, I think a lot of this pop up here uh, with some hype around it. Still interested in this company going into like 2025, the end of quarter of this year, into uh, Q1 of 2025. We were talking a little bit about how they had to stop production uh, for Amazon uh, because they had some kind of uh, issues at the plant that's been resolved entirely um, so no longer an issue uh, I just like following the stock I think it's interesting um, I don't really have a huge position in it or anything like that I just think uh, it's kind of neat let's talk a little bit about uh, well actually let's do SMCI first okay so they had yeah, kind of some bad earnings off even higher today, uh, trading at 434.56, off from 12.29. A lot of weird stuff going on with this stock, right? Obviously, you just saw Dell do extremely well. These guys are going to be really competitors in a major way, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit about Dell uh, later in the show. <laughs> so this is some crazy kind of news, right? I am really suspect of these big short firms. Um, that release papers on different stocks. Obviously, they are totally biased in, in, in this publication. Uh, I'm talking about Hindenburg in particular, right? Obviously, they have a bunch of shorts out on a company, so you always take things with a grain of salt. Um, but these kind of news publications, you know, they move the stock. It's hard to say. So we're looking at Hindenburg. They released something. This is on the 27th. A fresh evidence of accounting manipulation Sibling self-dealing and sanctions evasion at this AI high flyer. That's the name of the paper that they released. This is regarding super microcomputers. 
Uh, let's see some of the main points. Okay, so in August 2024, Supermicro signed an unusual 600 million contract to lease space at a California data center to sublease it to Lambda. CFO glossed over questions about the reason for this arrangement. Uh, Supermicro has claimed its liquid cooling technology will revolutionize the industry and has its uh, competitive edge, but a recent industry conference, Supermicro, featured related party Ablecom's liquid cooling solutions. Anyways, there was just a bunch, I mean, things kind of crazy. They have a bunch of bullet points uh, essentially saying uh, that Supermicro is kind of not being uh, super honest with what they're publishing. And then you have this come out, okay? And this is the 28th where Supermicro Computer is delaying uh, the 10K filing for the fiscal year of 2024. That in and of itself is just kind of not really, you know, a stock you want to be in when that's kind of happening, right? Um, so some kind of crazy developments on that, especially for a company that was at the heart of that massive AI run-up, okay? And then we can look at Dell, which again, these are these major, and another thing I say before we even move to Dell, but it has to do with Dell, is NVIDIA is SMCI's their, their, their biggest client, right? But Dell and SC, MCI doing the same thing. You then have Jensen Huang moving in, really talking about how superior Dell is gonna be. Now they didn't bring up SMCI, but this idea that Dell is the way to go for them. And if I were working for SMCI, or if I were a, you know, bag holder in SC, uh, SMCI, uh, that would make me a little bit nervous. We look at Dell a little bit. They uh, beat estimates of server sales soar 80%. Uh, so the revenue was 25.03 billion versus 24.53. Uh, They're trading up 3.62% right now at 114.74 cents. Those earnings per share are 189 adjusted versus 171 expected. Uh, the net income climbed 85% to 841 million or a buck 17 a share. That was up from 455 million, wow, or 63 cents per share in the year ago period. Revenue increased about 9% from 22.93 billion. For the current quarter, Dell said it expected between 24 billion and 25 billion in revenue. Dell's emerged as a top vendor for servers that can handle artificial intelligence workloads, uh, especially those based around NVIDIA chips, as demand skyrockets from cloud providers. Earlier this year, NVIDIA Jensen Huang called out Dell founder Michael Dell as a person to contact, place order for systems that include the company's new chips. So AI sales are in the company's infrastructure solutions group, which makes up servers and systems for data centers. And again, We've been talking consistently how this is the next, you know, major market, which is really building these servers. In fact, when it, right now, over the past maybe about year and a half, you've been seeing kind of a slowdown in some realms of tech. And I don't mean it like tech developers or anything like that, um, but legitimately a slowdown in hiring for networking guys, uh, for cyber set guys. Uh, you're, you're seeing even with... Um, with Cisco, they're getting rid of something, but the realm that has seen a massive influx of, of you know, on the ground networking guys uh, has been these massive server farms, which is super interesting. And that's probably not gonna slow down anytime soon. Folks, stay right there, we'll be right back. If you spend any time online researching trading techniques on how to begin your trading journey, you've no doubt come across many folks who push Forex trading as a way to make big money quickly. Unfortunately, there are equally as many stories of these so-called Forex professionals just looking to make a quick buck off aspiring traders without actually teaching the ins and outs of the Forex market. This is what sets Teddy Kekstack's The Tiger Forex Report off the riffraff. Every Monday, former Chicago Mercantile Exchange member and author Teddy Kekstad releases his Tiger Forex Report newsletter, where he dives into the complex world of Forex and takes time to actually teach you his methods that have made him so successful in the fast-paced and rewarding world of Forex trading. Furthermore, all subscribers receive access to archived live streams of Teddy's, where he provides university-level education to help you in Forex trading. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Forex awaits. The stock market is a delicate interconnecting web of commodities, equities, and trader psychology. When one string of the web is pulled, it has a ripple effect across the broader market. This is where opportunity lies. But how are you to gather all of this information into one cohesive model? 
when you're already spending your energy looking for any possible trade opportunities. Luckily, you don't have to worry about that, as Tom O'Brien has brought all important market news to you in one single newsletter, Market Insights. Market Insights provides a daily overview of what's happening in the indexes, bonds, gold, and more. Follow along with Tom daily as he analyzes the components that affect the overall movement of the stock market, giving insight into how each one plays either a bullish or bearish role. Tom also analyzes specific equities that he believes has the potential to make huge returns, and his track record proves his analysis right. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Don't let the market leave you in the dust. Building wealth trading in the stock market seems impossible to most people. They think it's too volatile and risky. Most people aren't going to take the time to educate themselves on how to do it right. But you're not most people, are you? At TFNN, you'll get the guidance you need to refine your strategies and techniques to invest like a pro. Because you'll be a pro. All TFNN subscriptions, books, software, and courses are available at TFNN.com. And I'm even going to tell you how to get them for less. Use TFNN's Tiger Dollars and you'll get up to a 20% bonus on your purchase. And once you apply them to your account, Tiger Dollars are automatically used for all future or recurring charges. Tiger Dollars also never expire, are fully transferable, and are a great way to add savings to your newsletters or services. Become the investor you were born to be at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Welcome back, everyone. Jacob Shoup filling in for Tom O'Brien. We were talking about Dell before we went to the break. Uh, just a few more things I want to go over with them. And I'm still trying to figure out how I feel, you know, about this this company. I mean, I, I think if you're seeing all this adoption of, of Dell's infrastructure um, by basically NVIDIA, uh, it seems like a good sign, right? But, you know, they're all from 179.70. Right, and this was, you think about it too, Dell's not necessarily innovating anything, right? It's kind of like we're backtracking and like, hey, you know what, Dell does this kind of well. I mean, this is old style stuff. Um, but it's, it's kind of getting it. And maybe if Dell's large enough, they can kind of pivot in a sense and, and stay around for a little bit uh, longer. So I'm going to go through this. AI sales and the company's infrastructure solutions group, which makes servers and systems for data center. It's the largest growing overall ISG sales rose 38% to 11.65 billion. The standout in Dell's report was the servers and networking revenue, which includes both AI oriented servers based around GPUs, that's NVIDIA and AMD, um, as well as traditional servers for older applications. So this is a quote, it says we're competing in all the big AI deals and winning significant deployments at scale. This is really huge for them. The unit reported 7.76 billion in sales, rising 80% on an annual basis. That's beating some estimates. Dell said 3.1 billion of that was AI server sales, up from 1.7 billion in the May quarter. Okay, and then the, uh, this is the operating chief. He also attributed the increase in revenue to server demand that continues to rise. And he said, this is important, that there was an increasing backlog of $3.8 billion in AI server orders that haven't been fulfilled yet. That's something to keep in mind. There's also a multi-billion dollar pipeline, quote unquote, of AI server deals from enterprises and cloud providers that haven't been finalized. The storage business fell, okay? And then the client solutions, which makes like the PCs fell as well. But it doesn't matter, right? It, when you're in this area and you get kind of like a, a portion of it that's just a cash cow, like really lean into that, right? And I mean, again, they're not really, you know, innovating any kind of development in storage, in PCs or laptops, you know. So I think it'll be interesting to keep in mind to see what goes on with them. Again, this is some pretty high volume uh, gap down, high volume the next day lower. Okay, you have some decent volume kind of trying to test that again, um, but then really just gives it up on that gap and we continue um, a lot lower. Okay, you get some really cool news. We're gonna stay in this kind of realm for a little while uh, with Apple, 
NVIDIA being in talks to invest in open AI. This is important to talk about as well. And Apple is, it's interesting for this, right? I, I think this is kind of the way to go. I, I think maybe tech companies, you know, I, I talk about it a little bit where I, I find it very strange that a lot of tech companies try to get their hands into everything. Now that has changed a little bit, obviously with the high interest rates, you're cutting certain portions that don't really matter. Maybe you're a little bit more uh, research oriented or developmental. I think what Apple is doing here is smart and just say, screw making our own model. I mean, why again, develop your own model like that where the point of it is really just to put it on to your major product. So Apple and NVIDIA are in talks to invest in open AI. Uh, the investment would be a part of a new open AI fundraising round that would value chat GPT maker above a hundred billion. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reported Wednesday that the venture capital firm Thrive Capital is leading the first round, which will total seven, uh, excuse me, several billion dollars and Microsoft is also expected to participate. Uh, Apple in June announced OpenAI is the first partner for Apple Intelligence, its system for infusing AI features throughout its operating system. The new AI will feature an improved Siri voice assistant, text proofreading and creating custom emojis. Wow, but that does generate capital. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I think this is the smart move instead of trying to develop your own systems. Because again, it's just gonna be put in, uh, Apple will obviously be making way more money just kind of licensing it. Um, there's some interesting stuff that I probably won't talk about today with generative AI, uh, but kind of discussing a little bit of the issues that it runs into, um, especially when it starts referencing itself, right? So there's all this, at this point, I think it's kind of run out of a lot of content that humans have created, right? For it to get reference from. and. So they started feeding it its own generative AI to see if it does anything different and it. It keeps getting less and less unique uh, and innovative, which is a major issue. Um, I use ChatGPT sometimes, but I just, I think I find a lot of times, and I hate to say it like this, because there's a lot of cool stuff it can do, but it's just not there yet. You know, um, it gets some stuff wrong, like pretty simple math problems, it gets wrong, it doesn't think about them properly. Um, which is kind of a shame. I think for explaining concepts like in a holistic way, OpenAI or ChatGPT is really neat, um, but we're kind of stuck there right now. And I wonder, you know, how crazy would it be if we do actually get to a point um, where these kind of general generative AI, not generative AI like within certain company systems or whatever, um, but you know, just kind of general AI uh, just kind of hits a wall of, of productivity or, or uh, ad advancing. Um, that'd be kind of a strange thing to see happen. And I think there are some people that talk about it. Let's move on a little bit. Still in the realm of AI, we're going back to our buddies over at NIST, uh, which you we were talking about the other week when I was on about encryption standards. Uh, so they, again, this is the National Institute of Standards Technology. Again, I super recommend just reading up on what these guys do because it's kind of crazy. Um, they just make standard products and procedures um, for so many things. And it's, it's just kind of weird to think that we have that, but it's very cool that we do. So let's look about this a little bit. Uh, the US AI Safety Institute signs agreements regarding AI safety research, testing, and evaluation. And this is gonna be with Anthropic and OpenAI. Today, the US Artificial Intelligence Safety Institute from the US Department of Commerce, okay, uh, announced agreements that enable formal collaboration on AI safety research, testing, and evaluation uh, each company's memorandum of understanding establishes a framework for the USAI Safety Institute uh, to receive access to major new models from each company prior to and following their public release. The agreements will enable collaborative research on how to evaluate capabilities and safety risks. risks. Safety is essential in fueling a breakthrough. Yeah, sure. And we've been seeing a lot of issues with that, right? We've been seeing uh, Russian propaganda being developed with this. Um, we've been seeing, obviously, yeah, I mean, you're even seeing it in... in the presidential race right now, not just among random anons um, using AI to pump out a bunch of fake stuff or, you know, people who maybe don't have the best English running it through uh, chat GPT so they can seem like they're actual Americans or citizens kind of talking about certain things, which is something that happens and it's kind of crazy. Uh, but you're even seeing it with some of the presidential candidates using it to create um, kind of, I don't want to say propaganda, but like just in a, I, I'm not, you know, 
no moralization on that term, I guess is what I'm trying to say, uh, but to make pictures for their campaign. It's very interesting. So I'd be interested to see what their kind of framework is, and this is really gonna allow us to fall in. This widespread adoption uh, by the US government and creating kind of these standards uh, is super important and definitely shows uh, that AI is here to stay um, without a doubt. And I find that kind of cool. All right, let's move over a little bit uh, to Intel. <laughs> we'll talk about it when we get back from the break. Uh, but surprise, they're up today, and it's kind of for a weird reason. We'll be right back. trading newsletters attempt to focus on a narrow set of equities or commodities. While this works for some, it oftentimes misses many opportunities that possess huge gain potential. But how is an independent trader supposed to scan the entire market looking for these hidden opportunities? One simple answer, the opening call newsletter. Basil Chapman, developer of the Chapman Wave trading methodology, has been trading the markets for longer than most trading influencers have been alive. And over that time, he has honed his methodology in order to accurately call movements in a wide range of equities, from semiconductors to uranium to key indices and so much more. Basil is old school, taking the time to educate the trader while also giving his insights into key indices, selective stocks, and more. Opening Call subscribers also receive access to dozens of educational live streams that can be accessed at any time for your edification. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So ignore the pop trading influencers and start learning time-tested technical analysis. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn. And he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, educating investors. The consistency you're looking for is closer than you think. One or two adjustments are usually all you need to change your equity curve from red to green and keep it there. Come join Larry Pesavento Live to learn what separates the winners from the losers. Join Larry Pesavento on the second and fourth Friday of every month for three hours of live trading from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time, where Larry will show you the market setting up and most important of all, the state of mind of a winning trader. By watching Larry trade, you'll learn the Fibonacci levels, you'll learn how to apply A to B to C to D trading patterns, you'll learn trade management, pattern recognition, and much more. Join Larry August 9th and 23rd for more live trading action. For this month only, use code LARRYOG24 at checkout to save $50 off your first month as a subscriber to Live Trading Rides for his live trading sessions, where you'll sit right beside him as he trades the market live. For this month only, enter code LARRYOG24 and save $50 off your first month. For all the information and to reserve your spot today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. This portion of the Tom O'Brien Show is brought to you by Direction's Daily Leveraged and Inverse ETFs. Whether you're a bull or a bear, you choose the direction. Visit Direction.com. Investing in the funds involves significant risk and should only be utilized by investors who understand the impact of leverage and actively monitor their portfolio. They are not designed to track the underlying index or security for more than a day. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at Direction.com. Read carefully. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. Welcome back, everyone. This is Jacob Shoup filling in for Tom O'Brien. I hope you all are having a good Friday. 
He had a long weekend, which is super nice. Looking at Intel before we went to the break, uh, we just kind of scratched the surface a little bit. This company is having some major issues. And that's pretty evident from looking at this chart here. Uh, disastrous earnings. Um, honestly, kind of misleading statements earlier in the year about how well their foundry business was doing. Um, obviously, the whole thing with the Raptor Lake chips, which was just bad. Um, and so the big news is why this stock is up 8% today. But I don't really think, I, to me, it doesn't matter. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit, right? If you haven't heard the news, it's sure everyone has, um, or most people have, but it's important to get it out there. So Intel is weighing options, including a foundry split to stem losses, okay? So this is the worst period in 56 years. They're working with investment bankers currently to navigate this. The company is discussing various scenarios, including a split of its product design and manufacturing business, as well as um, which factory projects might potentially be scrapped. Uh, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, which have been their longtime bankers, have been providing advice on the possibilities, which could also include a potential merger and acquisition. Whoa. The discussions have only grown more urgent since Santa Clara, California-based company delivered grim earnings reports. So, okay, a potential separation or sale of Intel's foundry division, which is aimed at manufacturing chips for outside customers. Um, I guess they're kind of expecting that that would be something that was going to go on. Gelsinger has viewed the business as a key to restoring Intel standing among. Okay, one, how long is that going to take? Okay. In the meantime, this stock is going to continue to just be feeding on the the ocean floor, essentially, right? And the foundry and manufacturing was still having issues regardless. I mean, to, not to be confused that, like, it's that portion of its company is doing well and other things are dragging it down. That portion of its company is doing very poorly as well. This is a big fundamental issue with Intel, right? And I'm, I get that the pop up today, and that's interesting news, and but it's just like these, these, this company had everything going for it in the sense that they've been around forever, okay? Uh, they were getting a bunch of money from the U.S. government, or in theory, you're going to, uh, to develop some of these chips and build them in the U.S. And then they just produce bad product that literally melts. So I, I'm not sure at this point that kind of talks like this, right, even really matter in the short term. And by short term, I really mean like a full year out. Um, I think stuff like that takes way longer. I mean, if something like a merger and acquisition happened, I mean, that even takes way longer. I said as well, um, expect big CapEx cuts from Intel over the next 12 months, which is not what you want to be doing right now when your other competitors are dumping a bunch of money, their clients are dumping a bunch of money as well. I mean, you know, Meta, all these guys are going to increase CapEx for purchasing chips. Um, Obviously, they cut the 15,000, but this is just going to be a really long-term restructuring effort by Intel. Uh, they just have some major problems. Their designs haven't been going well, like the new ones. They're not competing right now. Um, and I don't think just news on this it warrants an 8.45% increase. Now, you're only talking about 2184. This is a $93 billion market cap right now. You know, it's about half of what it was uh, earlier this year, like even in March, right? after that big drop in April. <laughs> Anyways, um, I, I think this stock does have a long-term term problem for growth and getting into AI. And, you know, I, I think the only thing it has going for it currently is that it's based in the U.S. and it can develop chips in the U.S., which is going to be a total security concern, uh, at least regarding companies that are outside of the U.S. Um, but, but right now, I, I see it kind of hard. I, I mean, if you see a path, right, you're listening to this and you see a path we're going to tell you, like, Jacob, you're completely wrong. Uh, this is why I would, I would love to see that. Um, and I don't say that, like, in a sarcastic way or anything. Um, you know, but uh, so right now, this just looks like a really bad uh, spot for this company to be in. All right. Let's move on to some other stuff entirely. Uh, looking a little bit at a firm. One second. Now, these guys do that payment process for the buy now, pay later. Give me one second to get the stock price. Or if I did, I would have typed it in, right? So that's up 4.39. All these readings are so strange, right? The fact that this company is surging, 
would suggest that people might be a little cash strapped. But then now you're seeing kind of a movement off from really just like the Magnificent Seven driving the kind of movements in the markets, and you're seeing things like Ulta doing okay, all right? Uh, guidance is getting trimmed on a lot of these. You have Best Buy doing well. You have Gap doing well. And then you have Dollar Tree not doing well, which you would expect to happen if people were really, really cash strapped. You have Lululemon missing, but that's more of like a managerial misstep. Well, let's talk about this, okay? So Affirm shares soared nearly, yeah, we're up 4.27. I mean, obviously this gap up was massive, uh, trading really from about, you know, let's say 31 area all the way up to 43.45 right now. Affirm said late Wednesday that revenue in the fiscal fourth quarter climbed 48% from a year earlier to 659 million and that its net loss narrowed to 45.1 million from 206 million in the same period a year ago. The company beat estimates for revenue and reported a narrow than expected loss. For the current quarter, a firm sees revenue in the range of 640 million to 670 million. The CEO, Max Lefchin, uh, said in a note to shareholders that the company set a new goal of hitting operating profitability on a gap basis by the fiscal first quarter of 2025. Bank of America analysts said in a note last month that rate cuts would be beneficial to a firm's funding costs for gain on loan sales. The company moves, excuse me, moved its merchants to a 36% APR cap on loans, good Lord, uh, up from 30% previously. Uh, projects that the new Apple Pay partnership could add $12 billion to a firm's total addressable market, uh, which is crazy. And again, this wider adoption of the buy now, pay later, um, you know, I don't see, I mean, maybe people do have money and they're just choosing to opt into this. Um, but I would, I would imagine a larger adoption, in, and again, maybe this is the case also that it's kind of more novel kind of experience, right? Getting this, you know, buy now, pay later to more people than had it previously. And so I think there are a lot of like mixed kind of things going on here. Uh, but that's kind of interesting, especially for, you know, an economy that's in theory, everyone's getting cash strapped. You're having more credit card usage occurring. Of course, you have less defaults, you know, compared to the numbers of, of people using these cards and acquiring the debt. Um, and then, like we were saying, let's look at Best Buy, right? Uh, they, they had great earnings, which I would not have <laughs> imagined either. Give me one second. Yeah, well, folks, stay right there. We'll be right back. Yeah, 100 bucks. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. For traders who crave risk, Direction's daily leveraged and inverse ETFs provide opportunities to magnify short-term perspectives with up to three times a daily leverage, utilize bull and bear funds from both sides of the trade, and trade through rapidly changing markets. These are highly leveraged ETFs with daily resetting designed for short-term trading, not long-term investing. Whether you're a bull or a bear, you choose the Direction. For up-to-date pricing and performance, go to Direction. Dot com. Investing in the funds involves significant risk and should only be utilized by investors who understand the impact of leverage and actively monitor their portfolio. They are not designed to track the underlying index or security for more than a day. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at Direction.com. Read carefully. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. The reality is that navigating financial markets can be risky. Markets can be chaotic and difficult to understand. Having the latest market advice can help you turn this chaos into a key for creating winning trades. At TFNN, we understand that it can be hard to find reliable market news. 
That's why each of our market experts offers their very own market newsletter, a must-have tool for every trader out there striving to find an edge in today's markets. TFNN newsletters cover every aspect of the markets so you can analyze the market before you trade. Try any of our great newsletters risk-free with our 30-day money-back guarantee. Just visit the Newsletters tab on the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no cash or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm Orion. What's going on, everyone? This is Jacob Shoup filling in for Tom Brian. Uh, we just have a one last long segment and a short one after. We talk about Best Buy. I mean, who would have thought this? Especially with a retail tech company. That's that's kind of weird. Or a retail company that sells consumer tech. Trading at $100 right now, massive volume to the upside. Trading really in the mid, you know, I don't know, 80, between 85 and 90 before the move. I really don't know what to make of this at all. The retailer now expects to see full year adjusted earnings per share in the range of $6.10 to $6.35. That is up from a prior range of $5.75 to $6.20. The company, however, lowered the top end of its guidance ranges for both full year revenue and comparable sales. As the CFO said, as we look to the back half of the year, we expect our industry to continue to show increasing stabilization. Earnings per share, 134 up, or excuse me, versus the 116 expected in that revenue of 929 billion versus 924. The company reported net income for the quarter of 291 million. That's compared with 274 million. The net sales in the quarter dropped to 9.29 billion. That's from $9.58 billion. Comparable sales declined 2.3% during the year compared with 6.2% uh, fall a year earlier. It's returning to growth. This is what the CFO is saying. Adding that Best Buy's positioning within the sector is helping the retailer to capture that growth in trajectory. I, I, you know, is this due? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see what's actually causing this. I actually did go to Best Buy recently, the first time in years, and I, I bought some headphones. Um, but that's because I didn't want to wait for Amazon. You know, I, I mean, is this driven potentially by these new, you know, AI on the chip computers? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, let's see here. So Best Buy has been in the midst of an attempt to turn around, okay, in response to two-year sales slump, which made sense, right? I mean, who is going into Best Buy to buy stuff? You know, discretionary merchandise retailers across the board have struggled with softer consumer demand in the wake of unusually high sales throughout the COVID pandemic and as customers pull back due to elevated inflation. As the much-awaited replacement cycle pandemic-era tech purchases start trickling in, the retailer is hoping to cash in through marketing and operational initiatives. Best Buy said in July that it would add trained sales team the three key parts of its stores, computing, appliance, and home theater to kick off a marketing campaign that includes YouTube videos to draw consumer interest. The company was also betting on a wave of new tech gadget debuts. Okay, I would say that there's probably, you know, from, from this, probably some hype surrounding these new AI computers, right? Uh, such as a collection of new iPads launched by Apple in May and artificial intelligence, okay, enabled laptops. The company on Thursday posted comparable sales growth of 6% in the domestic tablet and computing categories. Wow. However, there was a more than offset by declines in appliances, home theater, and gaming. Interesting. Barry added that AI could continue to boost sales across categories over the next few years. It's a quote again. We believe we are just at the beginning of the impact of the AI, and tech, AI on tech innovation and customer demand. They've seen a doubling in the numbers of consumers choosing to trade in old electronics for new ones, which Barry said is another indicator that people are wanting to renew and refresh. 
We capitalize on demand driven by our customers, desire to replace or upgrade their products. We see a consumer who is seeking value in sales events, one who is also willing to spend high price point products when they need to or when there is new compelling technology. Yeah, and it's like one of the hardest credit cards to get for some reason. I'm not sure what that's about. Anyways, pretty fascinating uh, to see Best Buy, really, again, a retail uh, store that sells tech to consumers, uh, your consumer tech. That's I would not have imagined that. That's really interesting. And again, I mean, these are not cheap products in any capacity. You know, I mean, these are like $1,000 computers, you know. Um, in the same vein, you're kind of seeing some really strong movements from Ulta, which is beauty. Again, just kind of these weird stocks, like doing very well. Again, I, I wouldn't have expected this earlier in the year. And things like Dollar Tree are getting just completely destroyed. Ulta's down right now, but let's take a look at this. Um, so they're missing the Wall Street expectations, but they're not trimming the guidance that strong, which is pretty nuts. You had Lululemon getting completely demolished. Let's look at them. So they cut guidance in a big way, missed sales estimates, and then had a botched product launch. Again, that's what I was saying. This is probably more to do with managerial things. So let's talk about this. Um, here's how the company did in its fiscal second quarter. The earnings per share of 315 versus 293, and the revenue of 2.37 billion versus 2.41 billion. Blue Lemon shares rose 2%, but they're off kind of sideways right now. The company's reported net income for the three month period that ended July 28th was 393 million or 315 per share compared with 342 million. Okay, still, I want to say, like, this is still a strong kind of company right now. I mean, you've had this downward trajectory, but th the earnings weren't that bad, you know? Um, let's see. However, Lululemon's profit guidance is roughly in line with what Wall Street anticipated. Yeah, the company said it expects third quarter earnings per share to be between 268 and 273. That's in line uh, with estimates. So you're seeing kind of like a small decline, but again, like, it's still somewhat robust. You even had... Inflation revised up. I don't know. It's weird. Someone says in the YouTube, don't try to make sense of it. I hear you. Uh, just, there's just a lot of moving parts. Let's talk about hymns as well. Uh, because I was a little bit concerned that Ozempic being taken off the short list uh, was going to crush them, which it still seems like it is. But, you know, looking at it, that was only 5% of the growth. Okay. I, I think there's a lot of like people reacting to like news with this, right? Um, that might not be a long-term issue. I, I, again, I think them not being able to sell kind of semaglutide compounded drugs scared people, um, but everything's still going really strongly for them, uh, for hair, everything's still going strongly for other things. Um, and again, that was only a small portion of their entire kind of product lineup. So I wonder if we're kind of getting to a discount area here, and I'm not saying that right now because I'm not entirely sure, and I wanna look more at the fundamentals uh, but, you know, I mean, you're testing that kind of area here. You're breaking down below it without a lot of volume. But you had a few trading sessions, four in particular, and, you know, or today we'll make four, where they're staying below it. You know, and this continues. You're going to probably get a consolidation below that high volume jump. Um, and then maybe we go back over when people kind of sober up and it's like, hey, maybe the smack of time isn't a massive deal, right? Um, there's a lot of cool stuff going on with this. All right, I want to talk a little bit. I know we only have kind of a short amount of time. Let me my clock up to see. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uranium as well uh, before we get to this last segment, okay? So taking a look at CCJ, this is Kamiko Corp. Some big news with this, okay? You have China ramping up nuclear production, right? They're going to use this for energy. I believe this is going to be the case uh, for the U.S. as well going forward. Some big news coming out of this, if I can get my notes up on it, is Kazataprom, okay? They produce the most uranium in the world. Okay, this is out of Kazakhstan. They announced a 17% cut. This was last Friday. 17% cut in the previously assumed output for uranium production in 2025 hinting on additional cuts for 2026 and beyond. They announced that they would ask the government to reduce existing subsoil use agreements, uranium mines, meaning reducing the annual production range of those mines. Now, here's the thing. These people who are buying uranium still need to buy the amount of uranium. Kazataprom is under 
producing essentially and they're gonna need to buy from other people I think Kamiko might be able to get in there we'll talk a little bit about that when we get back the stock market is a delicate interconnecting web of commodities equities and trader psychology when one string of the web is pulled it has a ripple effect across the broader market this is where opportunity lies but how are you to gather all of this information into one cohesive model when you're already spending your energy looking for any possible trade opportunities. Luckily, you don't have to worry about that, as Tom O'Brien has brought all important market news to you in one single newsletter, Market Insights. Market Insights provides a daily overview of what's happening in the indexes, bonds, gold, and more. Follow along with Tom daily as he analyzes the components that affect the overall movement of the stock market, giving insight into how each one plays either a bullish or bearish role. Tom also analyzes specific equities that he believes has the potential to make huge returns, and his track record proves his analysis right. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Don't let the market leave you in the dust. In the world of trading, only a few names stand out like Larry Pesavento, a pro's pro with over 50 years of experience. Larry has seen it all. A former Chicago Mercantile Exchange member, Larry has authored 10 books and trained over 1,000 traders with his unmatched expertise. Introducing Fibonacci 24-7, Larry Pesavento's daily trading service that turns the complexity of markets into opportunities. Published every Sunday, receive a comprehensive report packed with detailed commentary, charts, and videos that illuminate the patterns shaping the markets, with updates throughout the week exclusively for subscribers. Whether through charts or videos, Larry's analysis is your roadmap to navigating the markets. You can sign up now at TFNN.com for just $97. And with all TFNN newsletters backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to risk. For all the details, visit TFNN.com. You'll find Fibonacci 24-7 right under the Newsletters tab. The reality is that navigating financial markets can be risky. Markets can be chaotic and difficult to understand. Having the latest market advice can help you turn this chaos into a key for creating winning trades. At TFNN, we understand that it can be hard to find reliable market news. That's why each of our market experts offers their very own market newsletter, a must-have tool for every trader out there striving to find an edge in today's markets. TFNN newsletters cover every aspect of the markets so you can analyze the market before you trade. Try any of our great newsletters risk-free with our 30-day money-back guarantee. Just visit the Newsletters tab on the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, everyone. Jacob Shoup filling in for Tom O'Brien. The SPY up about 0.88% right now. The NQs up about 1.03% with that composite up about 0.99. And the Dow Jones up about 0.52%. We were talking about Kamiko Corp before we went to the break. Um, you have uh, Kazatomprom reducing the amount of uranium they're selling. My big argument with this, or what I'm trying to get across, is that the demand thing for the uranium it seems inelastic, okay? If you are already using uranium to generate electricity, you're gonna to continue to need that uranium. Basically, I think we're walking in, from what I'm, from what I'm reading, from the, some of these reports from the large companies, um, you know, like Kazatomprom or even Kamiko itself, uh, you're having a supply crunch uh, for an inelastic, uh, a product with inelastic demand, which is, you know, I mean, that's where you get prices soaring, right? It's gonna be super interesting to see what happens with that. Um, there's a big report uh, that Kamiko has. Uh, it's an investor presentation. If you want that, it's for Q2 2024. If you want that, email me at jacob at tfnn or just kind of say it in the den and I will send it to you. Uh, but, it, but it's pretty interesting stuff. You know, I would say too, Kamiko is interestingly placed as well because they're not getting, you know, they're not producing uranium out of Kazakhstan or anything close to the old block. Uh, these guys are mining in Saskatchewan, okay? So, you know, 
as far as international investing in international uh, kind of resources is concerned, uh, Canada is a pretty safe spot, pretty stable. Again, this is a long-term play. This isn't like, uh, you know, Kamiko's going to blow up, you know, up to its high of 56.24 um, in the coming month. Um, but, but I do believe in the long term that uranium is super, super interesting, and, and we're kind of going to be uh, waking up to that in a major way. Something to keep in mind is you have Broadcom reporting on September 4th, which is going to be uh, kind of interesting. Um, I'm a little bit interested in GoPro. Well, we'll have to save that for next time. Folks, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it was great being with you guys. Hope you all have a great uh, weekend. We are off Monday, so we'll be seeing you back here again at 9 a.m. with Tommy O'Brien on Tuesday. Take care now.